studies or of local neighborhoods. This isn't my normal territory at all. Um, but I did write a book on territory and I was really just interested in the states, justifying the state's geographical domain. And to do that I had to kind of examine the relationship between people and place. And there was a paragraph where I, so I, you know, you, you, you make an argument to get to somewhere and you realize that that argument is going to have implications for other things. So there was a paragraph in which I made a comment about a few other things that I thought it had implications for, one of which was gentrification. And, um, and then a couple of people cited it or wrote on gentrification, which I disagreed with, and said it was my view. So I thought, maybe I should turn my attention to that, having just written this like quick paragraph. So um, I got together with a colleague of mine, um, Mina Krishnamurthy, she's a colleague and a friend, so it was fun to write. And she, um, and she works mainly on philosophy of race, which I thought was important in discussing gentrification, and we wrote it together. So the paper is actually our paper. Um, so the structure of the paper is as follows. So first, I define gentrification. And that was hard to do in a way, because you could give a kind of morally you can give a kind of moralized notion of gentrification in which the wrong almost falls out of the definition you just gave. So I didn't want to do that. I give a kind of neutral definition of gentrification. And then I motivate the paper to try to explain that it's not that easy to figure out the wrong of gentrification. And then I describe three rights, three place-related rights that I think are violated. That actually explains the wrong, because if it's a violation of a right, it turns out to be a wrong. And then there's a, a, another section where I look at the psychological element, and that kind of builds on an argument. I'm not going to discuss that, because it's not actually central to the argument of the paper. And then I respond to two potential objections. I may not get to the two potential objections, but actually they're, they're so, I think you'll ask me, Anyway, <laughs> if I don't get to it, so I, I think that I will get to it that way. Are, are you going to keep track of the time? More or less. More or less. Um, I mean, I don't have it in front of me, but I will, I'm cognizant of time. Okay, so, um, 
So first I defined gentrification, and so I the term gentrification was first used in 1964 by Ruth Glass, who's, um, who used it to describe the arrival of middle class individuals and the displacement of lower class residents from an urban neighborhood, and she was talking about London, England. And today, since class and income are highly correlated with race, the term is often used to describe the displacement of racial minorities. So, and the displacement of black and Hispanic residents accompanies gentrification in many places, especially in the United States. But on this, on my account, it's not an essential feature of that process, at least in the sense that gentrification can occur in the way that Glass describes without any racial differentiation between incoming and displaced communities. But nevertheless, because they're often highly correlated, the impact on those communities is an important part of its problematic nature. So I just think that's true, but it's not defined in those terms. There's a disagreement about, what, about describing gentrification, and some of the definitions describe it as a distinct temporal event, but, most, but it actually looks now like as if that most describe it as a process with has distinct phase, phases, so displacement, and disinvestment replaced with replacement and reinvestment. And, they, and so those distinct phases might mean that you don't have complete gentrification as long as you have some reinvestment. A typical harmful consequences that are said to accompany gentrification, and I'm not disagreeing with this, are unaffordable housing leading to homelessness. Expulsions, homogeneity, meaning that once diverse neighborhoods become economically and culturally transformed. None of these are necessary features, or at least not all, all of them are necessary features. Um, so I just follow Sundstrom in adopting a kind of capacious understanding where gentrification refers to demographic, tur demographic turnover and economic change within an urban landscape. So there's widespread agreement. So now I'm going to motivate the paper because you might think, well, it's kind of obvious what the problem is. I mean, some people are going to say that, right? So the, here I'm going to motivate the paper, which is that there's widespread agreement, well, at least amongst the people I know, uh, about the negative consequences of gentrification. But there is disagreement about on whether and how gentrification might be wrongful. And that's hard, harder to show. And this is so for two reasons. The first is that gentrification occurs in a context where many different problematic features of society come together. So deep inequality and vulnerable populations and racism, especially in cases where class and income are highly correlated with race, often occur alongside gentrification. So you might think that actually gentrification isn't wrongful. What's wrongful are these background unjust conditions in society. That is, there's no distinct wrong about gentrification. What we have are a, a kind of society that's basically unjust, and these local features are highlighted in cases of gentrification. So then there's no distinct wrong about gentrification. And that's, um, so you might deny that there's a particular wrong about gentrification, and it's actually just the injustices in society. So that's one view. And it's a view that I initially held, I think. <laughs> the second reason why I might be denied that there's a specific wrong associated with gentrification is connected to a particular understanding of what makes something wrongful. So it could be regard, it could be thought that gentrification is a social and economic process that harms some people and benefits other people but itself is non-wrongful. And um, it's not wrongful because although it might set back the interests of some people, the process itself is the result of many different individuals making legitimate decisions in a market setting, even though the cumulative effect of these decisions are harmful to some people. So Peggy Cohn in her book, it's not clear she endorses it, but she describes it and doesn't object to it. So that seems to be something like Piggy Cohn's view. And, and that is true of many things in, the ca in a capitalist economy, most of which have differential benefits and burdens, and some have serious consequences for some people. So just think about a competitive job market, which might mean that some people don't get hired at all, or don't get hired to the best jobs. So it looks like some people's interests are set back and others are benefited. 
or consider setting up a coffee shop near an existing one, which may mean that the competitor will not surprise, survive and the owners and workers might become unemployed and bankrupt. So it's harmful to some people in the sense that the process can seriously set back the interests of some people. But you might think, well, this is a series of legitimate decisions that are made by different individuals in a market setting. And in that context, it's usually thought to be non-wrongful. And so some people could claim that gentrification is a process like that. It's accumulative decisions. It can be harmful, but non-wrongful. And often they think it's harmful to some people, but obviously it doesn't harm everybody. But that's true too, because most decisions. Um, and you might think that it, it, the harms are, more, are greater than the benefits. It could be true, but still think it's non-wrongful. So that's a reason why you might not think, might think that gentrification, there's no wrong about gentrification. And even when theorists do th think that gentrification is wrongful, they disagree on what makes it wrongful. So for many, the wrong of gentrification is connected to a common but not universal effect of some forms of gentrification, which is expulsion. And so in neighborhoods where the rent is lower than the market value, there's an incentive on the part of landlords to evict or replace tenants. And this effect, which is usually termed expulsion, is often thought to be the central wrong of gentrification. So Cohn, Margaret Cohn, talks about it as the central wrong. And people who, theorists who appeal to occupancy rights, and here it's the Huber and Wolkenstein, who are the people who initially wrote up the said to me. So they, the, um, they also view expulsion, they're centrally interested in expulsions, and it's that which makes it wrongful. <laughs> but gentrification can occur without expulsion. But you can have people clinging on in a neighborhood and not actually being expelled from that neighborhood, but um, finding ways to stay in neighborhoods even while development occurs and prices escalate. And also, if that's the only, if, and, and, and so there, even if we can have a compelling account of what makes expulsion wrong, we still wouldn't actually get to what makes gentrification wrong, we would just get to what makes expulsion wrong. So you might think that a theory about the wrong of gentrification should explain what the wrong is in gentrification. So this paper is a kind of response to a number of different concerns. So I, what I try to do is explore the relationship between people and place and the kinds of entitlements that people might have in relation to place, which I hope can illuminate the wrong of gentrification. So it relies on a theory of place-related rights to argue that there's a distinct wrong. And, um, and of course, because it's a rights-based argument, it can describe the violation or non-fulfillment of a right as a wrong. In terms of the theory of rights, I rely on an interest theory of rights, but I do not defend it. I just assume the truth of it. So my argument's not going to be compelling to anyone who has a different kind of theory of rights. And by an interest theory of rights, it's a theory where rights protect interests that are sufficiently weighty to justify holding others under a duty. That's what I mean by that. So um, in identifying the wrong of gentrification, I look at, well, I don't look carefully because I'm not really an empirical theorist, but I kind of look. <laughs> I distinguish between three different categories of people. Those who remain resident in precarious circumstances, displaced residents, and original inhabitants who remain in non-precarious circumstances. So there's always going to be original inhabitants that are in non-precarious circumstances, even though they might be the lower social class, especially if they're homeowners, right, in a really in a working class neighborhood, gentrification doesn't create pre precari precarity. Um, so the account I offer focuses on the denial of place-related rights. And here I suggest that we have a number of place-related rights and that the different <coughs> incidents of these rights could be and typically are violated in most cases of gentrification. So the three rights that I try to talk about are, that I talk about are rights to a home, and that's the section one, rights to residency in existing homes, that's section two, that, and that's a right that attaches to individuals, and it's typically a right against expulsion, but not exclusively. And the third is the rights to a community which are group-based and serve to preserve communal ties with others. And these are independent of one another in the sense that you could think of them as distinct incidents in the bundle of rights which typically connect 
um, people in morally significant ways to place. And then I argue that there's a distinct sense of disrespect um, that's associated with gentrification along that line. So that's those, and those three rights try to structure the argument. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about a right to a home, and maybe this is going to be the most obvious part of the argument, because it's what most people think is the wrong, right, in terms of expulsion. So one of the most obvious place-related rights is a right to a home. The term home, I mean this to refer to a familial dwelling that is locatable and has boundaries in the sense of an inside and an outside. It's located in space. It doesn't have to have a particular physical structure. It could be a tree house, it could be a house on stilts, it could be a caravan or a tent, an apartment or a mansion. I don't mean it to depend on a strong liberal view of private property, so the right being claimed is a use right to control the physical space and against being rendered homeless. And the right is grounded in both autonomy and well-being interests. So the well-being interest is kind of clear. It's a sort of um, it's often described in terms of a basic right to shelter. So since we are physical beings, we need protected access to sh clothing and shelter. We need a place to defecate and perform basic bodily functions. And this shouldn't be trivialized because the uh, adverse effect of home homelessness on street populations has been well documented. So um, the fragmentation of routines and relationships upsets the sense of continuity that people who have homes take for granted and is a fundamental condition for living a life that one feels in control of. So um, here, so Kara Nine has emphasized that secure access to one's private dwelling is key to our capacity to function autonomously. And the idea here is that cognitive functionings, including the ability to form memories and attachments, and to evaluate, reflect, and act on these values requires secure connections to physical objects. So she has this argument about the extended mind hypothesis. And the idea here is that a lot of mental functions aren't confined to the head, that people outsource um, mental functions to like alarm clocks and smartphones and, <coughs> and places to put things. And that people who don't have, and homes perform a valuable function um, um, in our environment. But I don't think we need to accept a kind of contentious extended mind hypothesis. I don't actually find it contentious, I believe it, but, um, but you can just think about how scarcity can capture the mind. Um, and this is being put forward by Malenin and Eldar. And I hear the idea of scarcity capturing the mind is the idea that, you know, whether the limited resource is sleep or security or time or food or money, individuals who live under conditions of scarcity have difficulty having their um, find their ability to plan for the future and to make rational decisions compromised. So because of scarcity, the poor spend much of their time wondering where their next dollar is coming from. So they have, in a way, less mental bandwidth available for something else, like planning for the future. And these, this sort of problem simply doesn't arise for the rich. And something similar can be said of those without secure housing who spend most, uh, so much of their cognitive energy on the necessity of finding shelter, worrying about where they're going to spend the next night safely, which may lead them with less bandwidth to think about the next, um, to plan other matters that are important to them. So the thought here is that being without a home impairs our cognitive functionings in ways that impact our rational agency and capacity for autonomy. So the thought is that having a home is central to our autonomy and well-being. I think it's almost obvious but I wanted to lay that out, right, to show that these are two distinct kinds of... And then the other kind of obvious point is that gentrification intersects with a right to a home in a number of different ways. And these are probably ways that are really familiar to you. So with the influx of more affluent residents into a poorer neighborhood, rents typically rise. Landlords have an incentive to raise rents and expel people as the area gentrifies because the rents that are being paid are lower than what the market can command. So in some jurisdictions, such as Ontario, which is where I'm from, from, there is restrictions on the rent increases that landlords can charge to sitting tenants, and that slows the process of gentrification, but it does not stop it. It doesn't stop it because as tenants leave, they are typically replaced by more affluent tenants, and then landlords demand market rent. 
In addition, landlords often find a way around this rule, either by converting rental accommodations to sale, which is what they do, which is really common in San Francisco, or they take advantage of rules that permit family members of the landlord to occupy the unit, or they claim that some repair is necessary, thus leading to eviction. It's really common in Toronto and Montreal. So even when people aren't evicted, their high, the higher prices may reduce the stock of affordable housing available in the city as a whole. But whether gentrification leads to homelessness is a little bit of a contingent matter. So if only one neighborhood is being gentrified, but other neighborhoods are subject to disinvestment and become affordable, and these are roughly equivalent in terms of autonomy and well-being interests, then you have a transitional problem, but you don't necessarily have, um, but it's only transitional. But in most cases, the process of gentrification occurs alongside significant price increases throughout the urban area, which means that there's less affordable housing available. And that's happening everywhere. So San Francisco and New York, everyone, like, like there's a lot of uh, literature on this. But actually, this is true almost everywhere. Um, but the figures are clear. Like, so for example, in the Bay Area, the number of low-income Families increased by 10%, while the number of units defined as affordable for the population decreased by 50% between 2000 and 2003. That's 50% was huge. Um, and this disappearance of affordable housing is noted in New York, because there a lot of the literature talks about the hundreds of thousands of apartments removed from rent control and placed on the deregulated market. And if that's the wrong, then it looks like the solution is to build more affordable housing. Um, that's the remedy. And that would remedy violations of that first place related right, right to a home. But the, my argument here is that this would be good, but it would not be sufficient to capture the full nature of the wrong involved in gentrification. It cannot, for example, account for the common idea that losing one's own home in one's own neighborhood through gentrification um, is wrong, even if more affordable housing is available somewhere else. So we have to explain that wrong, right? Why being displaced from your home is wrongful and not just from any kind of home. And I'm not trying to prioritize what's worse here. Okay, so that gets me to my second argument, which is the a residency right. So this, this, this argument has, was developed in terms of the territorial rights literature. Um, in terms of occupancy right. But here I call it a right to residency because the next two, both this one is section two and the next one are versions of occupancy rights, but I distinguish them. So I'm gonna call this a residency right. So there are two distinct um, counts of occupancy rights. Uh, one is in my 2015 book and the other is in Annie Stilt's 2019 book, as well as some articles that she published before then. And I'm going to focus on her account of occupancy rights, just because I don't want to talk about my account. You know, because I'm trying to do something different. So I'm going to talk about her account a little direct, not hugely different. Okay, so for Stilt's, an occupancy right attaches to individuals and is comprised of two main incidents. First, it comprises a liberty to reside permanently in a particular space and to make use of that area for social, cultural, and economic practices, and to be immune from expropriation or removal, and to return after a temporary absence. So this argument was developed, not thinking about gentrification at all, but asking the question about why it was that people, when they leave a country, like you fly somewhere for vacation, have a right to return. And that's a good question. Like, you've actually just left, right? What, what, <laughs> what is it that gives, that gives you the right to return? And there, the right to return, we knew the scope of that right. It's usually a right to return to a country. And then um, there is a question about when people are displaced internally, with it, how, how would it, why, where they have a right to return to. So, um, and I can't remember her argument, but, in the, but I have an account about the Labrador Inuit who, were, who lived in Labrador. They came to Caribou. And they were moved by the Canadian government to the high Arctic, mainly as, this is really shocking, but mainly as kind of flagpole bearers, right? Against really Russian and American 
concern about, their, about their, 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 whether the Americans and the Russians recognized our sovereignty. So they put indigenous people there. It was pretty disastrous, as it turned out. Predictably disastrous. Yeah. And then, the, yeah, and I mean, kind of, and, and the question, and then the question is, if they have a right to return, where do they have a right to return to? So it can't be the international law account of where you have a right to return to. And the thought is, well, it has to be the, lo the location of your life plans earlier. And so this account justifies, uh, so, th so, so this account suggests that people have well-being interests in located life plans. So still says they have broad well-being interests in carrying out morally reason pro reasonable projects that people have. Uh, um, and she both characterizes this as an autonomy interest in the sense that people have, are choosers and, they have, and, and make choices and, and plans. But also she wants to say that our located life plans don't have to be chosen, that we have well-being interests. And to render our located life plans secure, um, it's, we need to, one of the background conditions is that we have a right to live in the place where reasonable plans are made. So we have located life plans. And a number of normative theorists after that, who are interested in gentrification, have appealed to this argument to explain the wrong of gentrification, especially when gentrification involves expulsion from a particular neighborhood. So there's this article in PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics, maybe that's reversed, um, have argued that gentrification is a violation of city dwellers' occupancy rights, and Margaret Cohn uh, talks about occupancy rights. And there's a number of or which I call residency rights here. And there are a number of advantages to appealing to residency rights, which may explain why theorists of gentrification have done so. First, it explains why it's wrongful and not merely harmful. It's a violation of rights. And it also captures the idea, it also captures the problem of homelessness, right? It explains why homeless, homelessness is a problem. But it also explains why people have a right not to be removed from their home. So that's the second argument. But I think this argument isn't going to work fully. I mean, I accept it to some extent. In fact, I kind of advance it with respect to another case. But I'm not really sure that the located life plans argument gets us exactly where we want to go. Because while it really works for like the Labrador Inuit, where all their life plans were located in a certain area, in the case of urban, people, uh, uh, urban residents, our located life plans aren't usually neighborhood specific. You have, you have life plans related to something that's happening in the city. So if your life plan is to go to university, there's no, it's not just that one neighborhood can allow you to go to university. You can imagine you could move, move neighborhoods and still be able to attend university. And a lot of our, our life plans are located in a place, but they could be, it's usually more extensive than a gentrifying neighborhood. So that's the problem with it. Like, so it's not really clear that it really applies well to urban, urban neighborhoods. Although I think the argument works. I just don't think that that's the clearest case of it. Um, so that brings me to the third. Um, place-related argument, and, um, and this is where case, and, and here the argument focuses on communities instead of an individual argument that focuses on plans. So here the thought is that where there's a community which is forged by relationship to shared place, part of the wrong of gentrification is the loss of community. So in addition to the idea of a right to a home and also residency rights, connected to located life plans. The thought here is that we can think of rights that here, we can think of there being a group right in the sense that they're forged not simply independently by individuals living in a common place and happening to have some overlapping plans, but individuals as members of a community of people who share a geographical location with one another whose locus is defined by the activities and way of life central to that relationship. So I'm moving here from the idea of planning to the idea of relationships. So to elaborate on this idea, I mean, I have to read other people. I don't know about everybody's <coughs> relationships. So, um, so I, um, so, um, 
consider Tommy Shelby's discussion of black neighborhoods. He suggests that black Americans sometimes prefer to live in neighborhoods with a concentration of black individuals. This is, in part, because a critical mass of black people means that there are likely to be establishments and associations that cater to their preferences and interests, including, and I'm quoting, hair salons and barbershop, clothing stores, places of worship, restaurants, bookstores, cinemas, music and dance venues, art galleries and theaters, and retail outlets that sell <coughs> hair and skin care products. Having access to these local places can be important to the well-being and autonomy of black individuals. Building on this idea, one just suggests that it might be important for reasons having to do with the value of community. So over time, individuals in a neighborhood can come to value being in places with each other as part of their conception of a worthwhile life. They may go to a local restaurant, not just because it serves the food they like best, but also because the people who work there and eat there come to know one another. It's true of neighborhood parks and schools and stores. Over time, after frequently seeing each other in the same places at the same time, people may come to have a sense of affinity for one another, and they may come to see the resulting social ties as having value in their life. And there's a quote um, of Ramos talking about Willett's Point, which I understand is an industrial neighborhood in Queens, New York, as a small village, um, where the neighborhood they share together is one where they come to care about one another. So there's some kind of social ties and relationships that ex is expressed as a desire to continue to live with one another in the same neighborhood. And then one of the more, one of the, I thought, compelling accounts is um, Michael Henry Adams has The End of Black Harlem. He says that gentrification is wrong in part because it disrupts the collective interest that black people have in sharing place together. So he writes, it was painful to realize how even a kid could see in every new building Every historic renovation, every boutique clothing shop, indeed in every tree and every flower in every park improvement, not a life enhancing benefit, but harbinger of his own displacement. In fact, it's already happening. Rents are rising, historic buildings are coming down, the Renaissance where Duke Ellington performed, and the Child's Memorial Temple Church of God in Christ where Malcolm X's funeral was held have all been demolished. Nightlife fixtures like Small's Paradise and Lennox Lounge are gone. So here the thought is that place plays a central component on this, on, in the wrongs of gentrification. So his, um, historic buildings, parks, nightclubs, churches, places where black people come together are slowly being eliminated. So on this account, gentrification is wrong in part because it disrupts the places that Adams and other black individuals came to value as part of a life together. So. Um, Earlier, the thought was that, um, so I, I suggested that it was unclear how a right of residency can explain how individuals can be wrong if they're relocated to a new part of a city where they can still fulfill life plans. But I think now, I think this enables us, so we're now in a position to explain how we can account for this case. So to make sense of the loss, it's necessary to extend the individualist idea of a located life plan to include the idea of relationship interests and capture the idea that for many people, part of what makes a life, life valuable is, is that it is pursued along with particular people in particular places. That is to say, people have a strong, have a collectively shared interest that group members have in living in a neighborhood together, and in the case of gentrification, that it has been disrupted. Um, so, um, so this actually explains the wrong of gentrification, even in cases where residents are not expelled. So in the introduction, I said that we can distinguish between three types of groups who are affected by gentrification. People who are forced to leave because of rising rents or evictions. People who remain in place, often in precarious circumstances. And people who remain but whose position is not precarious. And this account can explain the wrong in all three cases. And it can account for the surprising fact that often people do struggle to remain in a gentrified place. The reason is easy to see once we incorporate this part of, on, in our account of gentrification. It's because people are attached to the neighborhood through their life plans and as a background geographical structure of their life. And while the transformation of their neighborhood is unsettling, it is not as complete as in the case of expulsion. And second, it can explain the wrong for all three groups. They all experience the loss of their community. That's clear in the case of displaced residents, but it's also experienced by people who remain but find that other people who shared the place with them have to go, as well as many shops and restaurants that, created, that cater to their social group. For these people, gentrification can be a disruptive, 
unsettling process and its wrong can be explained in terms of the loss of community. Then I have a section about humiliation and disrespect, which I'm not going to say. I think that. It's just a sentence here and here. No? Oh, because you know, because I was looking at it on the plane, and it was just going to be really complicated because it's based on a. But the thought was that there's an account which talks about gentrification as humiliation, which at first I was really persuaded by. But then the problem with humiliation, then I then I realized that what I really want to say is that there's a violation of rights, and that that constitutes disrespect. That's really. But it does build on her account, and it, it introduces a psychological element. Okay, so then I want to say there's two objections. I think they're pretty serious objections that could be made of this argument, both of which claim that it has counterintuitive implications. So I want to say that my complicated argument, it's a complex argument because it's a three-stage argument, avoids these implications that they charge me with. First, it might be claimed that this argument has proven too much. Does it make all community transformations wrongful, even if we think they might be morally permissible? I thought about this for a long time. Rafis Hassan has argued that the community-based view, a version of which I have just outlined, is counterintuitive in a number of cases. And he offers as an example Jewish people in Harlem who he claimed did not, who he says, do not have a claim against African-American residents who arrived through the Great Migration. But I think this threefold argument does account for this intuition because it builds on three important place related rights. In the first argument, I posited the right to a home, and this grounds an obligation to make room for the displaced. So the Great Migration was the result, as I understand it, I'm not a historian, but was the result of African Americans fleeing the South, where they were in some sense expelled by deprivation and unjust conditions. So on this account, the Jewish people of Harlem had an obligation to allow African Americans to make a home, and this obligation can be consistent with ensuring that Jewish people are also able to maintain their distinctive communities. So I want to argue that it doesn't have that account, partly because it's not just one argument, it's three arguments where they are, in, 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 to some extent, in tension. And the second objection charges occupancy accounts, of which this is a version, with being unable to distinguish between two different cases that we may want to distinguish between. That of a low-income individual who is priced out of a gentrified neighbor, neighborhood, and that of a well-off person who is also priced out of an increasingly popular neighborhood. I mean, you can be well-off but still priced out, right? And I think that might be true of some occupancy arguments, but not of this argument. Because this argument does provide us with the conceptual resources distinct to distinguish between those two cases. In the case of a poor individual, gentrification poses a threat to the loss of all three place-related rights. It jeopardizes not only the community that they live in, their relationships and commitments, plans and projects in that place, but the right to a home itself. For most of these individuals, their position in the neighborhood is precarious and there are few alternatives. And this isn't true of wealthier individuals who are not only able to secure alternative housing, but are more likely to be able to re re realize their located life plans, and are more likely to have located life plans that are non-neighborhood specific, because they have greater opportunity sets. I mean, that's an empirical claim, and, it's, um, and obviously it's individually variable, but we may reasonably expect that people who have, have a lot of income and maybe have left already to go to university or whatever, they've traveled across the country, um, uh, are more likely to have um, located life plans um, that aren't neighborhood specific. Okay, so that's uh, my answer. So, I, so it does distinguish between those two cases. But it may say that, that even well-off individuals may also experience a loss of community, right? It's not that, they, that there would be no loss. Okay, um, so the argument in the paper, I'm just going to sum up now, because um, I was given 40 minutes, um, identifies three, dis I'm just going to summarize, it identifies three place-related rights. It argues that all three are threatened by gentrification. Um, I've examined the justificatory argument that grounds the entitlement in question and argued that the wrong of gentrification consists in the violation or non-fulfillment of those rights. What I haven't done 
because it's just a work in progress, is have a discussion of the shape of the duties that flow from the rights of, above. And the duties we can understand as possibly in tension with one another. So since it's an interest-based account of a right where if you have an interest sufficiently weighty, that it justifies duties. It will justify not just one duty, but a range of duties. And those duties are actually going to be in conflict. And here the thought is, I'm just going to off, here I, I think the, the way to think through this is something along the lines of Jeremy Waldron when he talks in the conflict of rights. But I also want to say that, that that move is open to me be, because I view property rights as conventional. So I think I would be in real trouble if I believed that property rights were natural, because property rights are what's are actually going to come into conflict here, right, in general. But I think property rights are conventional in the sense that um, we have a state that tells us what our, what, the, what, what our property rights are. They tell us what the rules are for the acquisition of property, the transfer of property, the taxation system. There, there's, it's, it's the state that's supposed to maintain the rules of justice and tell us what the rules of property are. And the thought here is that any adequate specification of those rules ought to take into account place-related rights, the, the three rights that I've explicated. So what needs to be done now is a discussion about what kinds of rules, if you're going to have a, rent, a market in housing, that's an open question, but if you're going to have a market in your housing, how would you specify those rules in a way that would protect those three interests? Um, I also, um, just a, a concluding kind of thought, is that I don't think that um, there's a, I then have to ask whether gentrification necessarily involves a violation of those rights. And I can't think of a single case where gentrification doesn't involve a violation of one of those rights. However, I mean, you could, you, in, uh, there is a, Regents Park in Toronto was a kind of uh, gentrification, there was gentrification in Regents Park where there was an attempt uh, and, and to protect all three of those interests. And that's a sort of an interesting case. It didn't succeed fully, mainly because it took so long for the city to do it. But the thought here was that um, um, they wanted to invest in housing stock and in community buildings and in parks, but only to add additional housing while trying to ensure that existing residents remained in the place. So that is to say, the investment was all additional and not and, and ensured that existing residents remained. And, and the reason it, was, it didn't fully work is that some of those homes had to, were like, probably not safe. And it took them a long time to actually prove them. So some people did leave. But the thought is, that it, it, it might be possible to have gentrification and try to avoid expulsions and precarious housing. So gentrification here meaning investment in housing. Um, try, uh, try to avoid expulsions and precarious housing that we typically associate with gentrification while adding investment and housing stock, which might change the social mix to some extent, but preserves the existing residents who can maintain their relationships, plans, and projects while making room for new inhabitants. So it's one case where there was an attempt. It was the only case I could find. That's it. Thank you. Claims to have responded to major objections. Perhaps there are other well, questions. Well, I only said that if I didn't say that, I'm sure you'd think of it. I'm sure there's others. So I'm interested in your right can you, do you have an idea of how one acquires these rights? Are you born with them, or do you acquire them by occupancy? Are they inheritable that comes from your parents living in a place? Or if I rent an apartment for two months in Washington Canal, do I have a perpetual right to stay in Montreal because I had a place-based ownership for some period of time? How do I acquire these rights? Right, so the thought is, so in some sense, the argument suggests, the argument, I think all, I think, so I think the right to a home argument, which is the first place related right, is really just based 
on people being physical beings and what kinds of meat and that they need shelter and they need home and they need security. So that's so I think that argument is uh, works differently than the other two. So that's um, I don't know if that counts as a natural right, but it's a right that it's a universal. You, but we can think universally that people need homes, right? Um, and it's not that the other two aren't couldn't be universal, but they would be contextually specific. So the thought would be. Um, the, the, so, if so, we, we, so the way to think about so the, I think the way to think about the acquisition of rights in these kinds of cases isn't um, like, as if individuals come to some kind of planet and 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 have various rights that they take with them. The thought is that people live in a place and they're located in a place and by living somewhere they develop plans and relationships and moral interests and they develop relationships there. And these relationships and interests that they have are different from people who don't live there. And so the thought is, and, and that could be universal in the sense that that might be true of everybody, but it means that we don't just view, that we have to view people as in some sense situated. And that the being situated in a place gives rise to morally significant interests. And because it gives rise to morally significant interests, they, it, the, uh, the, you'd have to think would be elevated sufficiently to give, her, to, to give rise to duties. And then, um, and then your, your sort of more rhetorical question about, well, when you live two months in a place, do you have perpetual use? Well, probably none of the arguments could justify that. Um, but, um, um, but it would suggest that, that we as a community, like a, a larger political community, should take seriously the fact that people have place-related interests and that there's a heart of it, and that and that um, and which should try to organize our societies in ways to protect those interests, and so hold people under duties to protect those interests, and probably those interests can only that are um, the only thing they can be generated over a long like a long period, um, and I don't have a cutoff point for each individual one, but. I think that looks like it's the picture. And if that's, and, 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 and just as a kind of aside, when you're putting it against property, when you say, well, does somebody who rents an apartment get an interest after two months? I mean, it's a funny thing that we think that people have rights to return to their state. And then that must be because of some kinds of interest that they have this kind. And there's very parallel arguments as well with neighborhoods which have been completely ignored. So, I mean, so if you think that's true in the one case, then you have to consider as well this second case, where it may even be that the interests are as powerful. And, um, but it has more unsettling implications, right, for the way we organize society. Jesse? Thanks, this is really, all really interesting. Um, I guess I have a question about the right to community. And that is that I, I see, so I see the, the sort of in, in, intuition here, right, which is, yeah, you know, your barbershop closes down, right, the restaurant on the corner, like, you know, it all gets forced out. But I'm curious, would this also encompass cases where maybe, you know, people aren't priced out, you know, your sort of community members aren't priced out, but say they just choose to leave and they just pursue greener pastures, right? Like, like oh, you know, we just don't like this place anymore, we're moving, we're closing down our restaurant, we're closing down, you know, so-and-so. And slowly, you find yourself just left in a wasteland as people leave. Would, the, would, would those people leaving violate your right to community? That's a super interesting question. Because I, I'm, I mean, because I, so of course, I think relationships have to be two ways, right? I can't force you to be in a relationship with me if you don't want to be in a relationship. So that's like a, a short answer. But I think that's a really interesting question because. Um, I think because there's all I mean so so there's I no correlative duty on the part of the 
part of your fellow community members to stay there. Right. No, I, I actually do think that's right. Like, people don't have a duty to remain, right? That's a problem. Yeah, and I, but I actually think that it is a puzzling kind of problem, right? Because, and the reason it is, I don't, so I don't actually think this is, um, this is a devastating criticism, mm -hmm. but I do think that we, that we need to think hard about the kinds of, about, about the sort of loss that occurs with depopulation. So, um, uh, I mean, this is expulsion, but also depopulation. So, so on the one hand, you know, you, you, we do recognize that, 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 that there is, that there are these um, strong, um, that people do have these strong interests. And there, you might just say, well, you, it would just be wrongful to, to hold anyone under that kind of a duty, right? It would just violate their liberty. And that might just be this, this, the, the easy answer, right? That you can do things to facilitate people, right? That the, the state only has certain kinds of mechanisms that it can employ, and so it can't stop people from leaving. And that might just be the answer, that there, that that will lead to a loss of community, but that's just inevitable when people leave. You, but you might think that there might, so if you thought that, you might think that there are still things that could be done to ensure that there could be a community. Because sometimes right. there's massive disinvestment in a place. I mean, I know in Canada, when they actually, when places have basically shut down, the state closes the post office, they close the school. I mean, it's, expensive to run, right? It's more expensive than if you move them to a larger place. But if you thought that neighborhood, that community was, were important, you might have a different calculation about what the state should easily do. But I, I would be very reluctant to think that people shouldn't be at liberty to leave. I would just be trying to say, but I, but I, but I think that we might want to think hard about the structures that might um, Lead people to leave. But yeah, but I still think that's not a fully adequate answer because um, um, <coughs> there are places that have just become completely depopulated. And so actually, I was hiking in Spain through villages that were like big towns that are now only have like six or seven people in them, and there's hardly anyone. And so these last people who are there. They see the doctor having left, the schools having left, the children. I mean, I mean, have they experienced loss? I think, I mean, absolutely they have. And my thought is, well, you just can't stop people from leaving if actually there's just no, I mean, there, there, there might be things you can do to make it so that people don't feel like they have to be. So my thought was like, you just can't do anything. But I, I did think hard about that when I was hiking and very bored. Because <laughs> mentally you're pretty bored hiking, right? That's the point. <laughs> that is the point. You shouldn't be thinking about this. Okay. Yeah? Um, hi. Um, I have a question about um, uh, the back of the paper where you mentioned um, the Huber and Wolfenstein um, quote. Um, it was um, a plan-based right to remain in a neighborhood where the social, cultural, and economic practices were located. And you mentioned that, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned that a a location-emphasized place-based right might work in one particular setting, but it has issues when it comes to like an uh, overall structure. So you mentioned how, for Inuit, this makes sense, but for the urban ed, uh, for the urban uh, neighborhood, this may not necessarily hold. Could, be the, could it be the case that the reason why is because, um, and, and I don't know about people who are welcome to I don't know who they are, but um, uh, it could be the case that they have in mind the Inuit that the reason why you use that example was because this is accounting for a sort of a historical material group. So the reason why it doesn't apply to even someone like me is because I'm not indigenous. Like this is, this, this is not supposed to apply to me. Um, that despite the fact that you know, these histories, like here in the US it's weird, because you know, the US is weird. But uh, uh, um, despite the fact that I'm me and I'm living here and I have all these particular issues, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm still a settler. So maybe the reason why is that this particular understanding of a location emphasized place-based right is maybe giving a sort of like a, 
a credence to like you know the original populace or something. It, 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 despite the fact that you, who's not one of them, also have issues when you're kicked out because of you know the rich white person who's in. Um, could that be the case? Why it seems to only work for yeah, the Inuit? Um, I mean, so the thought that if that's I, correct. Yeah, so that that argument was initially developed to talk about the. Uh, to, as, a, as an example of located life plans. Yeah. So still chooses the idea of located life plans. I actually think located life plans doesn't, is really also, there's something jarring about that language with even with respect to indigenous people, right? Because it makes their entitlement based on being a planner. I mean, so it's actually not an historic argument. It's about their, the plans that they have that happen to be located. <coughs> But to the extent that it works for the Inuit people, I think it's because, in, in this case, mm -hmm. they were all in one pretty distinct area. The, all their plans were located. But, so it's a really good example. I mean, it's a kind of over-determined example, because we think they have those entitlements anyway, for the reasons you just gave. Yeah. But, um, but I, I, I think that the, I mean, there's another kind of problem with the located life plans argument. It's that, I mean, it's hard to explain, but if you have plans in life, plan A, B, and C, and I have plans, and my plans might be B, Q, and X, and you have plans, and they might be X. Okay, so some of those plans are located here, and some of them are located in the city, and some of them could be very far away. And there's nothing to say that they're going to converge. Well, I mean, what would make them converge on the same place? Well, it's because if people live together, they're more likely to converge, but they're not, it's not clear they're going to converge in the same place. And it's not clear they're going to describe a community, right? Because different people have different located life plans. So that argument about located life plans, I believe that our plans are located and that this does get, and, and that's one of the reasons we should think hard about people in place. I just don't think it's going to work well for urban residents, and I also think the language of planning might be too, like it's a highly individualist notion. Industrial? That, that's my favorite word. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, I mean you could have shared plans, but whether they're shared is yeah, a contingent, not. Quick, contingent question. Can yeah. I ask one or two things? First of all, I'm a little worried this could be question begging the right to the community. How do you define community? such that it isn't simply the right to stay in the neighborhood and settle the question by definition. Right, so I mean, I, I don't so actually, <laughs> yeah, so I don't actually in the, in the paper, um, I have a terminological issue, so I don't actually talk about a right to a community, I just okay. say, although it is in that handout. But especially if you see it as located, it's sort of like you yeah. settle the thing by definition. Yeah, no, no, I don't think it does. So there was an argument there, not a definition. So um, the argument was, in the first case, it was connected to people's plans and aims. And in the second case, it's about relationships. So I think it's a kind of relying on relational morality here okay, a little so, bit. So let's say you move the entire community somewhere else, so they still have the same relationships. So the difference, you'd have to appeal to one of your other rights, right? It would be an occupancy thing? Well, or are you trying to understand the role of place as somehow, how are you understanding place in relation to that community in which all the relations could remain more or less the same in another place? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So, um, uh, so I understand the question yes, uh, more clearly, I think. Um, so in that description, I try to do two things, which is describe people as being related to each other. So one of the reasons we care about the place is because we care about people who live in the place. But it doesn't, but I think we, that we may also care about the place too. So that's why I use the example of people caring about their churches or where Malcolm X has delivered his oratory or, I mean, that it might be that we have relationships with people and that of course they live in a place. But we may also have relations to place. And that's a very alien, that's a thought we no longer really have. We just don't understand what that is. 
But there's all, and, and we have no language and liberal political thought to really talk about that, I think. But there's all kinds of evidence in literature and in songs that people care about place. Like it's, like that's really some care more than others. Like some guys more in community. Some care. We care less. Because they, you know, Orthodox Jews can reconstitute their community. They do well, more. It, it, but the place may be the, the place. The places sure. could be different. They might not be the same. Like a nomadic people might have a different account of place. But and it's interesting because when the when the some of the expulsions have occurred. And this is true of St. Hilda's in Scotland, but also the Library of Inuit. They moved them. They saw the individuals were peeling off, and they moved them as a group. All the so, indigenous, all the reservations, Indian reservations, were moved as a group. Physically moved as a, as a group. So you think that if all they care about is the relationships among people, shouldn't be a problem. And yet it led to profound. I think it's the disgrace oh, yeah. and right? the humility part. Well, yeah. there's, I, I, and, and, and that's an interesting that's thought. Real connection to the land is a there's very a, important feature for them. Right. Which is what Less I was thinking. Communities. I mean, and so you might think, so, so I guess, so I guess the, a, a way, so we have evidence of it. So your point is, well, that you can find evidence of it, but it's not a universal feature. Not to the feature. same degree. Exactly. And, um, if you move the Orthodox closer to Jerusalem, they'd be happier. Then if, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, moved and <laughs> um, so so you might say, well, you know, not everybody feels this, but um, I I wonder whether no, so, yeah I um, but I don't I think so I think that's clearly true of indigenous people that they have very strong connection to place, but I think that that may also be true of other neighborhoods where there have been um, where they've been where they have a where it's 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 place specific, and they and they have relationships with place. So um, I think and it might be against important. their will idea. You're downplaying that too much. The wrong of it, you know, that they haven't chosen the self determination element would seem to play a role here. That it isn't merely that they've lost the place, but they're sort of forced to move. You're downplaying. Oh no, no. I actually. I mean, I haven't really. I haven't. Um, I don't dis it, you're right that it's not discussed. Like, do I think that the coercion is a really important part of the wrong? That's a kind of obvious wrong, coercion. I mean, so, so I didn't really think that I needed to discuss the coercive element. So the question is only whether, in addition to coercion, there is any independent wrong with actually having to leave a place, whether that's a, an additional oh, element of the wrong. Because I just took it for granted to some extent that coercion <coughs> is a pretty serious violation of rights. So I was only asking, could there be also place-related rights? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm going to pass the question. Okay, and then I, So what I wonder is, where in your account does the harm that re is results, or that's reflected in the loss of a community of values. So that, for example, some, let's say the Upper West Side in Manhattan is, was a lot of intellectual life was the basis of that community. In the village, Greenwich Village, the arts world. And that gets, through gentrification, uh, displaced by money, <laughs> the value of money. So where, in your account, does the alienation from shared values play a role because it's a really painful experience um, that we go through, at least in New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I haven't actually. Um, that's a really good. I mean, that may actually be an additional argument that needs to be theorized. Um, but I haven't done any theorizing. I haven't theorized that Spend at all. Spend some more time in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so all I did here, all I did, and 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 I, I think, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I, ha I think I may have a worry about that, even though I think that that might be real. All so all I tried to do here was to ask the question whether there. I mean, so was to try to give three three account three kinds of rights that we might hold that are related to people in place and to suggest that gender that, that those constitute 
that, there, that if we have rights, that these might be the kinds of wrongs that could explain the wrong objectification. I mean, of course, there's also the coercion element, right, which, which isn't of course, gentrification specific. It's because there's coercion everywhere. And there may be, and there's many others. And you're probably right that values are an important part. But I, I don't actually discuss values except in a, a little bit indirectly, right? Like in terms of people being related to place and to other people. Yeah. You might assume that, there's, that, that, that this community could be emanated by values. But I don't, but I'm a little worried about a direct appeal to values. And the reason I'm worried about a direct appeal to values is because I want to leave open the thought that communities can change and can legit and 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 that we do and, and because we can't just privilege I mean I want to give importance to the existing community and the relationships of people into place but since people also need homes we also need to I mean I can't make I can't just privilege incumbents and um, so yeah, so, so I haven't, so, so I, I would be a little worried about the idea that value had to be static, I think. But, you, but I haven't actually thought hard about that and, 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 and what that, and, and, and how that could impact the argument, which it could do. So um, yeah. yeah, and to build on that, are you worried that your third rule specifically could be inherently turned against your argument? So a major, a major problem right now in New York is scarcity of housing. And a major contributor to it is the prevalence of single-family homes and the reluctance of those communities to allow multifamily zoning or apartment zoning for affordable housing. The argument that I think they would use is this is a violation of the community that we've built up. Yeah. Therefore, you cannot do it. Yeah, right? right. So, yeah. and then are you concerned then that it's just just as that makes gentrification wrong, that also makes you know, the evolution. Yeah, so this is a version of the case that I, the Great Migration discussion, which is just really a discussion about um, which, which I tried to respond to through that example. And, the, and, and I, think that, I think that the community argument, if, it's, if that was the only argument we accepted, would be exactly would it would be sub would have the effect that you that you have right? People would say, oh, this is our community, and it's a community of low density housing, and it's a community of right, and it would have People exactly like that. yeah, it would have exactly yeah. the effects that you say. But what I want to say is, there's three different arguments here, and where there's a right to a home, and actually. I think, I think that argument's a pretty powerful argument that people need homes, they need secure and affordable housing against expulsion. And then I have these other two arguments. So what I'm trying to do is to say that all three have to be in the picture. And therefore, what you need to do is to try to create, try to think about ways in which you can protect all three. Have affordable housing and have no displaced residents and have, I mean, I mean, all three have to be in the mix, and they're balanced because they are potentially in tension. So that was the reason I think that, you know, that, that we actually need not just one argument, but a multi-tiered argument. They're not incompatible, but you would need to, des to describe in more detail than I have done the kinds of duties that the state might have, the ways in which it should think about housing, yeah. right, to avoid these. Okay, my, I guess my question was, but you just sort of answered it, that who owes these duties? So you're thinking it primarily in terms of the state, and that's, that's all, is that correct? It's, okay, okay, sure. Another interesting way that these could stand in tension with one another, this isn't meant to be a criticism, because I'm totally on board with demanding more housing from the state, um, is that the right to a home can come into conflict with the right to community the other way, right? So a lot of the time the way gentrification starts is not by super rich people moving into a neighbourhood, but super kind of <laughs> really people who are maybe making the same income as the people who currently live in that community, but are students. Um, and that can also 
degrade community, but those people have a right to a home. Um, most of the students that go to this place are under the poverty level um, and are moving into neighbourhoods um, because simply they don't have the money to live anywhere else, right? So I guess I was just trying to get clear on who owes that du those duties. Um, but if it's just the state, I mean, sure. Well, I think it's I not know. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm not to blame. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just move on in. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess, what, I guess what I'm trying to, what I, I have a kind of basic view. That's actually really helpful. But I, so I think the basic background view is that the state sets the basic structure of society, and it should do so with with a kind of idea about what, what our, our rights are and our duties. And then we operate within what we hope is a, base, is a background basic structure in which we're free to make decisions. Now, whether or not we also have obligations to think about our own individual behavior within an unjust structure, I haven't discussed. So this argument proceeds entirely at the level of how, how would the state how what we as a political community organize the basic framework so as to realize these rights. I think you could say more about what individuals have got to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think you're right that, 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 that they will come into tension in the way that you suggest. Mm -hmm. And then I think that when we're thinking about how we organize or our, our place, places, that we would try to balance those interests. I mean, I mean, you know, sometimes some, it's not the case that any, having some students in a neighborhood mm. is going to destroy the neighborhood. But you can imagine, in some context, that, the, that, it, that it could lead to a kind of problem. <coughs> and in neighborhoods, that, and in, in some places that, in Canada, because we have, um, rent controls for sitting tenants, landlords will charge market rent when it comes available, and then they'd like to rent to students because they get higher turnover and they can keep renting. So people who want to stay actually have a put in applications to rent and can't find a place to rent. So I mean I mean there's many, many tensions here. But the tensions aren't just in my account, the tensions are no. in the world. And then the question is how do we how do how do we how do we think through those tensions to have a fairer, a more just structure? Um, any other questions? Well, that was a nice concluding thought. So I always like references to a more just world. <laughs> I wish it were happening. Uh, so please join me in thanking Margaret Moore for